So hello, everyone, and welcome to Fusionity Talks, a student-led webinar platform for sharing knowledge about nuclear fusion science and engineering. I'm Katerina, and today it's my pleasure to introduce you our alumni, Sundarasan Sridhar, uh, who will be speaking about uh, runaway electrons studies uh, and how it runs in the wall. Uh, Sundarasan got his uh, Bachelor degree of science in physics from Madras University and India, and then he joined our Fusionity program and spent his first year in Nancy and then moved to Ghent. As well, he spent six months in IPP uh, Institute in Prague for his master thesis, where he has started working on runaway electrons in compost tokamak. And after finishing his master's degree, he joined CEA IRFM for his PhD project on runaway electrons on collaboration with ITER. And he's a PhD student at Ex Marcel University. Uh, but I'm glad to congratulate Sundarasan that he has defended his PhD thesis recently. Congratulations. Thank you. So without further delay, I give the floor to Sundarasan. Um, thank you, Katrina, for a really good introduction. Um, so as she told, my name is Sundarasan Sridhar, and uh, I'll be talking about runaway electrons. So this is an abstract from my PhD defense, which was uh, which which occurred like a few weeks a few weeks before. So um, before going to the before going to my work, I would like to give some background and motivation, starting from the tokamak performance. So the tokamak performance is given by the Lawson criterion, which talks about the fusion triple product, which is the density, temperature, and the confinement time. In the, in the last few decades, there has been a drastic improvement in the tokamak performances, as you can see in this figure. Uh, and normally the fusion power increases, uh, it's proportional to the mission size. Uh, currently, ITER is the world's largest tokamak, which is under, constru uh, which is under construction, uh, which aims to get at least Q equal to 10, which means that uh, at least uh, 10 times more input power is is derived from the it can be derived from the mission as output power, and normally higher plasma current are required for a better confinement of the plasma. But the problem is when you go for a higher plasma current, uh, there the 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 corresponding damage to the tokamaks due to plasma disruptions uh, increases with the plasma current. So first, let's see what is this plasma disruptions. So this in the plasma disruption. Uh, or a tokamak disruption, there's a loss of thermal and magnetic energy of the plasma in a very short time scale, as you can see in this figure, where the plasma current drops drops in a very, very short time scale. There are two main phases of uh, disruption. The first is the thermal quench phase, in which, uh, in which uh, there is a loss of the thermal energy, the current quench phase, in which the plasma current decays rapidly. There are three main consequences of disruptions. Uh, the thermal loads, the electromagnetic loads, uh, the electromagnetic forces, and the run of electrons. The thermal loads usually occur uh, during the thermal quench phase, in which uh, a lot of uh, thermal energy is localized, uh, is deposited locally to the, to the plasma facing components, which may destroy them, as you can see in the case of jet. Second type of consequence is the electromagnetic forces, uh, which can cause damage to the tokamak structures. And the third type of this uh, disruption consequence is the notorious run of electron beam, uh, in which uh, this is uh, in which it causes localized wall melting, as you can see, uh, as you can see the beryllium wall melting for the jet tokamak. Uh, so uh, this tokamak disruption is a major threat to the robust operation of future tokamaks, including meter, because of the risk it carries. And, uh, the, and in, in, my, in my PhD thesis, I'm concentrating on the runaway electron consequence of disruption. So what is a runaway electron? Runaway electron is, uh, is an energetic uh, electron beam, which has energy uh, roughly in tens of MUs of energy, and it causes severe damage to the plasma phasing components and the structures beyond them. So these runaway electron seed is primarily generated by 
the primary mechanisms. The first of its kind is the dry cell generation, in which uh, and which a thermal electron diffuse in velocity space to the runaway region. The second type of primary generation is the hot end mechanism, in which when there is a rapid cooling of plasma during the thermal crunch, uh, there is a tail of unthermalized uh, hot electron which run away in phase space. And the third uh, third type of uh, primary mechanisms can be due to tritium beta decay and cotton scattering of gamma rays. So primary mechanism uh, uh, generates a seed of runaway electron, which can be then multiplied by secondary avalanche mechanism, in which the runaway electron, the thermal electron, has no collision. In the, as a result, the thermal electron can be uh, can be jump can jump to the runaway region and run away. And normally, the multiplication of the runaways due to avalanche mechanism goes exponentially with the plasma current. So simulation suggests that in ether, up to 10 mega amps of runaway beam can be generated with energies between 10 to 20 MeVs. Uh, this makes runaway electron uh, prevention, control, and mitigation uh, some of the hot topics in thermal physics. So let's talk about what is the current strategy for the mitigation of the runaway beam. The strategy is to use a massive material injection to avoid the generation of runaway electrons and mitigate the heat and electromagnetic loads. Uh, there are two tested methods in tokamak for delivering massive materials. The first is the massive gas injection in which gases are injected by a fast wall. And the second type of, uh, type of uh, second method is a shattered pellet injection in which cryogenic pellet are shattered by the vent tube. And currently ether uh, disruption mitigation system selects uh, shattered pellet injection to be employed for to, to, to mitigate the runaway electrons and disruptions. If the first massive metal injection cannot avoid the generation of runaway electrons, then a second massive metal injection will be used to mitigate the runaway beam. Uh, for instance, this uh, this scheme was successfully tested in uh, tested in Aztec's upgrade. As you can see that uh, by the injection of uh, argon and neon massive gas injection, the, the, the it, it can successfully mitigate the runaway beam. But uh, in the jet, uh, we have a problem. So what happens is when we, we try, try to use the scheme, this runaway mitigation was successful when we are using high, uh, high Z massive gas injection just for some discharges. And for some discharges, there is no apparent effect of the second massive gas injection on the runaway beam. Just look at the figure. So the one in the red, there is no mitigation injection. The one in the blue, there is a mitigation injection at this point. As you can see, there is no effect of the mitigation injection on the total duration and other characteristic of the runaway beam. Uh, the possible reason for this uh, inefficiency of the runaway mitigation is the poor penetration of the second massive gas injection into the runaway beam due to the presence of the cold background plasma from the first massive gas injection. So uh, the efficiency of the second massive metal injection to mitigate the runaway beam may depend on the characteristic of the background plasma. So let's see what is this background plasma we're talking about. So this is, uh, so this in, in a healthy plasma, argon massive gas injection is injected, as you can see from this figure. So this is a visible camera image, which triggers disruption. And after disruption, we have a background plasma uh, from the impurities of the first massive metal injection, in this case, argon background plasma. This background plasma is very cold, uh, so this may act as a uh, barrier to the penetration of the second injection used to mitigate the runaway beam. Uh, when looking at the interferometer, uh, interferometer meter, which is looking in the open field and region far uh, outside the subclatrix, uh, in the car number four, as you can see here, even in, in this place, uh, we have densities uh, up to 10 power 18 to 10 power 19 uh, per, meters, uh, per, per meter square, which means that the background plasma is present all over in the system. So this, this, this can, uh, this can uh, act as a barrier to the uh, penetration of the second massive metal injection. So this is, it is very important to understand how the second massive metal injection under an beam interacts when there is a, when there is a cold background plas uh, plasma uh, present outside the runaway electron uh, beam 
for for reliable runaway mitigation system. But the problem is, in general, the characterization of the background plasma are very poorly known, uh, especially the electron temperature. So in this thesis, uh, this is focused in understanding the physics of interaction. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. So I have divided my talk into three parts. The first part is the experimental characterization of the background plasma. And using this experimental characterization, uh, I, I experiment based 0D or 1D power balance of the background plasma is made. And in the third part is the simulation of the background plasma using a 1D diffusion model. And, and I will end my talk with summary and perspectives. So first, let's see the first part, which is the experimental characterization of the background plasma. So for experimental characterization, uh, we are using the VU spectroscopy. And uh, in VU spectroscopy, we are deriving the line intensity, the, the argon line intensities, which depends on the electron temperature of the background plasma. So our strategy is to construct synthetic line ratios, uh, which is uh, which is constructed using the photon emissivity coefficient from the ADAS. And it also depends on the temperature profile we assume. So by fitting that synthetic line ratios, which depends on the temperature profile with the experimental line ratios, the temperature profile parameters are estimated. I will go on to the results of database. So now we will uh, now, so using this, uh, using this method, we have uh, estimated the temperature for a database of discharges, and we will see the results now. Before going to the quantitative analysis of the database, first we will use the qualitative analysis. And uh, as you can see, uh, looking at the VU spectra, so this is a typical VUV spectra in jet. Uh, when, so this is the line of sight of the data, so it's weaving inside the plasma where the background plasma coexists with the runaway beam. So most of the bright lines are argon one plus and argon two plus nine lines, and up to argon eight plus lines are seen. So in order to see uh, what comes from the run direct excitation of the runaways and what comes from the background plasma, we are looking at the time point in which the spectral, the V spectrum, uh, the V spectrometer is weaving far outside the background plasma where we don't expect uh, the runaway beam or, or any runaway electrons in this region. So even in this region, we have the brightest lines of argon one plus and argon two plus between 80 to 100 nanometers. So um, what, we can, uh, what we can say here is that uh, the bright lines, uh, uh, the bright argon one plus and two plus lines may come directly from the thermal part of the plasma rather than the runaway excitation because even without runaway excitation, we are having argon one plus and argon two plus lines. Uh, on comparing the typical jet VU spectra with D3D, so this is an example of a D3D typical uh, spectra in which uh, disruptions are triggered by argon massive gas injection. We don't see argon lines like in the case of uh, jet, but we just see a free bound recombination continuum. So uh, we can say that qualitatively that uh, this may be because uh, D3D has a much colder background plasma so that we don't have argon lines and we just have a continuum. So qualitatively, we can conclude that uh, the jet background plasma may be much hotter than the D3D background plasma. Now let's go to the uh, quantitative analysis uh, of the temperature we estimated from the V spectroscopy. So uh, the jet background plasma is between 6 to 18 EVs when it is when disruptions are, are triggered using argon massive gas injection and four to six EVs when disruptions are triggered using argon shattered pellet injection. Uh, this is much hotter uh, background plasma in jet uh, than on other tokamaks. For instance, in D3, I've estimated the background plasma temperature to one to two EVs. Uh, this, is quite, this is consistent with our qualitative uh, uh, analysis of the VU spectra. In addition, the background plasma uh, in jet uh, was found to increase with the gas amount you used to trigger disruption, as you can see in this figure, and the electron uh, density in the fast crap of air region. Now, using this temperature estimation from the VU spectroscopy, we use this as an input to uh, a power balance of our background plasma, which we will see now. So for the power balance, we are considering three systems. The, 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 the beam of runaway electrons and the, the, the background plasma in the confined region. So this is uh, defined by the EFIT reconstruction. 
and uh, the biogonal plasma in the open field and region outside the confined region. For the RNA beam, it is accelerated by the electric field and it loses its power by synchrotron and brainstorm radiation. In addition, uh, RNA waves can impart a part of its power to the background plasma through collisions, and the brainstorm from the RNA waves can be absorbed by the background plasma in the open field and region, and also in the confined region. For the, for the background plasma in the confined region, uh, in addition to the collisional power transfer from the runaway beam, it can gain power through ohmic power, and it loses its power by land radiation. In addition, some of the uh, in addition, heat can be conducted from the background plasma in the in the in the confined region to the open field and region, and from the open field and region, it loses its power by land radiation and heat conduction to the wall. Uh, now, uh, now we have we we have analytical formula uh, for all these powers. And we now apply this to a jet discharge. We, we apply to two, two jet cases, one having higher power, higher electron temperature, one having lower electron temperature. And uh, we we make a, uh, we assume a D3D discharge based on based on the articles written on them. Uh, so now we will see uh, how we compare uh, di different discharges uh, quant quantitatively using the analytical formula for different power terms. So first system is a runaway electron beam. As you can see, almost 90% of the runaway beam loses its power through collision to the collision transfer to the background plasma. And about 10% of the power is radiated as synchrotron radiation. And uh, as compared to the synchrotron radiation, the Bremsstrahlung radiation is very small. So uh, as a result, we can conclude that the collisional power loss of the runaway electron is the most significant power loss term uh, than the synchrotron radiation. Now going on to the next system, which is the confined uh, background plasma. The collisional power transfer is the primary source heating the background plasma in the confined region. And the, the when, when, when we try to estimate the radiated power you, based on the temperature profile estimates from VU spectroscopy, is consistent for one discharges and it is not consistent for all these charges. And this, uh, this uh, overestimation of the radiator power may come from a lot of uncertainties in them. So uh, another interesting observation we can make from, from this study is that um, for discharges with uh, higher background plasma electron temperature, for, for, for example, in this case, it has around seven EV background plasma, in this case, around three EV background plasma. Uh, it has higher collisional power transfer per free electron, as you can see here. So this may be, uh, so the high, uh, the higher collisional power transfer per free electron may be the reason for hotter background plasma in some, some, in some dis, uh, jet discharges. Uh, now looking at the background plasma in the open field and region, the power conducted to the wall is very small and is negligible as compared to the power radiated from the background plasma. And when you look at the total power loss from the open field and background plasma, it is very small as compared to the power loss from the confined background plasma. So now going on to the last part of my talk, which is the simulation of the background plasma using the 1D diffusion model. Let's first see what is this diffusion model. This diffusion model was developed by Eric Holman initially for D3D Tokamax to understand the background plasma. And he shared the code uh, with, uh, with us for, to implement the same code for the jet background plasma. So this code works on the continuity equation by which it solves the, uh, it solves the uh, uh, species density profile. So when, when we say species, uh, we consider argon and deuterium species in this code. Uh, in this continuity equation, it solves the it solves the continuity equation. So there are two mechanisms. The first is the diffusion uh, of neutral and ion species and the change in the species density profile due to this due to diffusion. And it also considers atomic processes such as uh, ionization, recombination, and charge exchange. So uh, based on the species density profile, it computes the runaway electron density profile. And thus, by uh, and thus by 
uh, by uh, matching the radiator to the power profile and the uh, other species density profile, it computes the electron temperature profile. So the inputs of this model are the argon uh, and deuterium content, as you can see here, the line integrated density and the radiator power profile. And this model gives the species density profiles, the free electron density profile, the, the, the energetic electron density profile and the temperature profile as outputs. For this model, um, creatine atomic model is used for the ionization recombination and cooling rate fluctuations. It is to be noted that in this model, it assumes that the electron and ion temperature are the same. So uh, we have implemented this model for discharges in which disruptions are triggered using argon massive gas injection. And what we can find here is that the temperature of the background plasma is, uh, is almost independent of the organ mass metal injection amount used to trigger disruption and the electron density in the fast type of layer region. This is quite inconsistent with what we have observed by the, uh, by the electron temperature estimation through VU spectroscopy. And in addition, uh, the only diffusion model predicted a uh, much lower electron temperature than the VUV estimations for the massive gas, uh, uh, massive gas injection discharges. When we are using the same model for the SPI discharges, uh, the argon, uh, which triggers the argon background plasma, the electron temperature is still independent of the argon mass metal injection, which is still inconsistent with the temperature from the VU spectroscopy. However, the predicted temperature of the uh, shattered pellet injection discharges are within the range of the predicted uh, temperature, uh, within the range of the estimated temperature from VU spectroscopy. And, uh, and comparatively, uh, the, the, the model predicts much higher temperature for discharges in which uh, disruptions, uh, disruptions are triggered using argon shattered plate injection than massive gas injection, which is opposite to, which is the, this is the opposite trend of what we observe from the VEV spectroscopy. So uh, the question naturally arises from this is what causes a discrepancy between the predicted uh, temperature from the only diffusion model and the estimated temperature from the V spectroscopy. So what we suspect is the atomic rate coefficients we are using in the in the only diffusion code. Uh, in the only diffusion code, we are using creatine atomic data, which is a basic uh, shielded hydrogenic model. Whereas for the temperature estimation from V spectroscopy, we are using ADAS atomic data, which is based on collision radiative equilibrium. So our, uh, our presumption is maybe this inconsistencies between the predicted and the measured temperature may arise due to this uh, different uh, atomic, atomic data used in the only diffusion code. So in order to just to compare the basic difference between creatine and ADAS, in, in, in ADAS, it predicts much higher ionization of organ and much lower recombination of organ. Uh, for the cooling rate coefficients, both are comparable except for organ neutral, which is way too, uh, way, it, which, are, which are magnitudes higher in creatine than in ADAS. So as a result, ADAS always predicts higher, uh, higher, higher, uh, higher ionization state of organ, whereas creatine always predicts lower ionization state of organ, as you can see in this figure. So what we did now is we, re we have replaced the creatine automate data in the in the only diffusion code with the ADAS to see if, if it is consistent with estimated uh, temperature from the V spectroscopy. So when we are using the rate coefficients from the ADAS atomic data, the only diffusion model predicted much higher temperature as you can see here, it is around 17 EVs in the center, which is much higher than three EVs predicted by creatine atomic data. And it also predicted much higher electron density and uh, this, this temperature predicted by the model using this ADAS atomic data is consistent with the temperature estimated from the VU measurements. Uh, so now going on to a uh, different type of experiment with organ-biogon plasma, uh, we are using this 1D division code to understand these experiments. So before going on to the simulation uh, simulator, So in Sundar, jet, I'm, I'm afraid uh, we'll experimental lost. campaign, we have tested two shattered pellet injection schemes to mitigate the runaway beam. 
The first one is using the argon shuttle pellet injection. And the second type of experiment is using deuterium shuttle pellet injection. When you're using argon shuttle pellet injection in the vacuum plasma, there's a fast shutdown of the runaway beam, which means uh, we, are, we are mitigating the runaway beam completely just after the injection. But when you're using deuterium SPI into the background plasma, what we are seeing is the plasma current increases, as you can see in this figure, and the electron density drops to very low value as measured by the interferometry. So as a result, we, what, we find, what we found is we have a drop in the argon UV line brightness and the UV spectra becomes deuterium dominated. And in the, in the end, we have the Binyan termination of the Renewa beam in which, when, in which the beam just disappears with no significant wall impact. This, this, uh, this was all, the, these results were also observed in the D3 document. And uh, this experiment is, uh, so in this, like we are, we are really interested in this experiments. And the main problem is we cannot employ the temperature estimation from VE spectroscopy for this set of experiments, because we have to assume a pure argon plasma, which is no longer valid when you inject a lot of deuterium into it. So by simulating this argon background plasma using this quantity diffusion code, it may help us in understanding better the physics of the interaction. So uh, before going to the jet results, first let's see what is observed in D3D. When we used only diffusion model for the deuterium uh, experiments in D3D, it predicted total purge of argon particles after the deuterium entry, which means that the temperature, the, the, the electron density and the argon density drops to very low value uh, predicted by the only diffusion code. On the other hand, in jet, it doesn't predict the total recombination of argon. Indeed, there is a drop in the electron temperature after the introduction of deuterium SPI. But on the other hand, there's a, there's increase in the free electron density, which is opposite to what we have observed in the experiments. On looking at the argon density, indeed, like the, there's, a, there's, a, the, there's a shift in the argon line densities, which means that the argon line densities is dropping. And uh, as you can see in this figure, the argon two plus is decreasing, and the uh, argon deuterate, which is which is normally found in the low temperature plasma, is emerging just after the deuterium SPA entry. So one possible reason for for this discrepancy between the predicted model and the experimental uh, and the uh, and the experimental observation is exclusion of non thermal radiation in the one D diffusion code which seems to be a special case for JET, which, we'll, which we will just see after this slide. So uh, in general, in JET, when we are using the 1D diffusion model to predict the deuterium SPI cases, the 1D diffusion model indeed predicts some trend such as drop in the electron density and the argon line den argon density, but, but the predicted drop is not low enough for the, for the total recombination uh, as it was observed for D3D. And, uh, and the next thing we are doing is to find if, if the model can predict the drop in the argon view line brightness. So for this, we are, using the, we are using the diffusion code results of the electron temperature profile, the, uh, the pre-electron density, uh, density profile and the species density profile. So what we observe is after deuterium SPA entry, the argon line brightness. So this is the, just the ratio of argon line brightness to the deuterium line brightness. So, uh, just after the in introduction of the deuterium SPI, the argon line brightness drops to very low value. And this is qualitatively consistent with the VE spectroscopy. But quantitatively, there's a big dis disagreement uh, between the predicted model and the VE spectroscopy and maybe they are due to the overestimation of the electron density. So in JET, uh, when we apply the only diffusion code, it predicts a low, uh, it predicts a drop in the argon line brightness at a deuterium SP entry, which is qualitatively consistent with the UV spectroscopy. We have seen on, in our previous slide that we were, we were blaming non-thermal radiation uh, for the over prediction of the electron density by the only diffusion code. Let's see what is this non-thermal radiation. So in JET, just after deuterium SPA entry, we see two to four megawatt of radiator power. Uh, 
at, at, and we expect very low temperature and very low density because this is what we observe experimentally. Uh, so this may be due to the non-thermal radiation, which is a special feature of jet. In D3D, for example, just after deuterium may sphere entry, the power radiator from the plasma is, is drops close to zero. And uh, when you try to zoom, uh, when you try to zoom, this, so this is the region just after the deuterium SPI entry. Uh, we uh, we see that the peak of the radiator power is higher for discharges with lower argon amount. So normally uh, the, the 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 power radiator from the plasma is proportional to the impurity content. So this is the opposite trend of what we normally expect. Uh, in Northern Garland, in his recent publication. Uh, he was talking about the Renabe impact excitation. So at very low temperatures, uh, which is what we expect for the for the Oregon first cases in jet, uh, he infers that at very low temperature, the non-thermal radiation due to the Renabe beam is much more significant than the thermal radiation. So uh, this the, this radiation may not be thermal because uh, uh, because it, it doesn't explain how we can have this much of high radiation at very low temperature and density, but rather it may be at the non thermal radiation due to the interaction of the Renewe P. And the next uh, natural question to ask is if we change the input radiation amount in the code, uh, which is what we expect, uh, can we see a total uh, drop in the electron temperature and density? So, for this, what we did is we have decreased the radiator power due to the thermal plasma. So this is the thermal fraction of the total radiator power. So for example, in this case, we assume only 10% of the total radiator power measured by the volumetry comes from the thermal part of the plasma and the remaining 90% is from non-thermal radiation. And in this case, 1% is from the thermal part and 99% from the non-thermal radiation. So by decreasing the radiator power, it's going closer to the experimental result. So we expect density around 10 power 18 per, per meter square and the temperature we expect very low value. So it's going in, a, it's going in, the, in the right way and the more organs are recombined when we decrease the radiator power. So uh, after deuterium SPA entry, the non-thermal radiation may be predominant, which is, uh, which is now not uh, predicted by the code. So going on to the summary and perspectives of the code uh, of, my, of my talk. The, on doing the experimental characterization of the background plasma, uh, it was found that jet background plasmas are much hotter than in other tokamaks and the background plasma temperature increases with argon massive metal injection amount and the electron density uh, in the fast type of layer region. On doing the power balance of the Renewe beam and the background plasma system, the collision power transfer between the Renewe beam and the background plasma is the primary source seeding the background plasma and higher uh, collision power transfer per free electron may be the possible explanation for a hotter background plasma. On using the only diffusion code uh, to simulate the background plasma, it predicted much lower temperature for the argon background plasma than the VV estimations for the argon massive gas injection. When we use this code uh, to predict, uh, to, to simulate the deuterium SPI into the argon background plasma experiments, it over predicts electron temperature and density for, uh, uh, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't predict a uh, total recombination, which is opposite to what we observe, uh, what we observe experimentally. The over prediction of the electron density and temperature may be due to the uh, due to the exclusion of the non-thermal contribution in the total radiator power in the code. So what we did is uh, we have substituted the cretin with another atomic data called prism spec data, uh, which also takes into account of the non-thermal radiation. So on changing it, we are seeing a better simulation, meaning that it is more closer to the experimental observation. But uh, we are we are having a bit of issues with this, and uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, time, and uh, I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, detailed explanation of such an important topic. Now the floor is open for questions. While I'm waiting for questions, I will maybe ask mine. 
it might be very simple, uh, but based on your research, could you tell uh, which pellet materials are advisable for ITER and uh, how can you extrapolate your research for ITER case? Okay, for the extrapolation, uh, I'd like to be on a very safe side. Uh, so, you know, like uh, in fusion, the things which work in D3D may not really work in JET. So this is what we observed for the argon case and for the deuterium case. Um, so it's very difficult to extrapolate. So, but, but you know, like uh, let's assume ether works in the same way as JET. I think the deuterium HPI is, uh, is a good work in progress. Uh, which which try which tends to mitigate the beam uh, in in a in a very benign way, so for now, but this looks favorable. But we are not really aware of all the things. So these are quite new studies. So, but uh, but I but in my opinion, I would say uh, argon shattered plate injection or argon uh, argon shattered plate injection is quite good in uh, terminating the beam in jet. So it works in jet and also in D3. So it may be a reliable scheme, but but again, like it comes with a significant wall damage. Uh, so if we understand more on the deuterium SPI into the organ background plasma, then yes, it will be a good candidate for ITER. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And as far as I understand, there is not much experience with uh, SPI in other tokamaks like jet, D3D, uh, there are not many of them who are doing it, right? Um, and, um, to my knowledge, uh, in K-Star, they, they are employing uh, shattered plate injection as, at different positions uh, mm -hmm. to see, um, so they have quite good results. Uh, quite good research. I'm not really aware of the results, but I know they should have some results by, by this time. Uh, yeah, JET, D3D, and K-Star. And I think in Aztecs, they, I'm not sure if they have it already, or I think they have it already. So Aztecs maybe, um, and I think like in the coming years, the Tokamaks may have it as well. Mm -hmm. Let's hope for more. Oh, I see Jan Mlinar has a question, right? I, I will I will unmute you in a moment. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, above all, compliments for your work. It's very nice, and I'm happy I could watch it today. And my, my question is in the direction of Yekaterina, in fact. So I was wondering if uh, you believe that your result that the background plasma temperature increases in, in jet uh, due to collisions would be similar for ITER. So do you expect that in ITER, the background plasma would be also perhaps even hotter than at the jet due to just the size or is it too oversimplified? Uh, I would say it's so oversimplified because we just have two tokamaks so we have d3d and we have like you know all the tokamaks and we have jet so we are we are not really sure if it increases the mission size or it's just you know like a step function so is it like low like small tokamaks have one to two evs and the big tokamaks like it, it it may be the case that jet and eater may have the same background plasma so uh this this is not really uh like with the mission size, I think we have very less data to conclude anything about it. Uh, so probably ether may be hotter than jet. So the, in this, I can't give a clear, uh, clear answer on what what is what. So if we expect ether to act in the same way as jet, then yes, we we may have uh, a, 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 a background plasma hotter than jet, but maybe not too hot. Like let's like one or two EVs more but maybe not, not so much. I see. Very interesting. Thank you. We have to try. <laughs> yeah, okay. we have to try. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye and take care. Thank you. See you. Anyone else have questions to Sundarasan? I don't see any. So I would like to join you uh, to thank you again uh, for joining us today. And this is the end of official part of this webinar. So. I